creation we sing your praise every tongue every nation your name forever lord i surrender mighty king you're my true defender all the earth
shall I fear? The Lord goes before me, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? In the dark, I can't see. before we worship. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you are a God, Lord, that gives us hope, Lord. No matter the time, no matter the season, no matter the struggle, Lord, you are there. And God, I pray that we would remember to call out to you. God, your word tells us to, Lord, all who are weary and heavy laden to give you our burden, God, Lord, and that you will carry them, God, that you will give us direction and hope, God. Lord, you are the God of all joy and peace. And God, you want us to trust in you. Lord, for us to experience that joy, that hope and peace, God. And Lord, I pray that as we sing now, Lord, that the weights would be lifted, God, knowing that we are worshiping the God of the universe. Lord, that there is no problem that is bigger than you. Lord, no situation or circumstance that, God, that you can't handle or tackle. God, go before us now. Lord, we pray that we would sing from our heart. And Lord, know that you are the greatest God ever. Lord, that there is none like you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. If you would, let's stand and worship together.
good to be in a season where we can sing these songs. We're going to teach you a new one this morning, although it should be quite familiar. We're going to be singing the, a chorus of John 3.16. Maybe you've heard this song, maybe you haven't, but we're going to go through the chorus and then hopefully you guys can create the sound out there as we raise our praise to our King, to the baby who was born but ultimately had a destination. That destination is the place in which we find our trust, our hope, our salvation, right? He went to the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Let's sing this together. It goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Sing it out. God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world. You guys got this. You didn't need practice. Oh, come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners. Come find his mercy. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table that never is fine. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. We sing it out, God so loved. Oh, for God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live Oh, the power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. Open arms. See his open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Now it is well, I'm walking in freedom, for God so loved, God so loved the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. 
His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Oh, the power of hell will ever defeat us. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world father as we sing a familiar christmas carol lord we desire for our hearts to see your birth not as familiar, God, but for the wonder that it was, the wonder of your spirit upon Mary, Father, the wonder of a humble place that you chose and humble circumstances and humble people. Father, we desire for our hearts to be the same and that, God, you would fill us as we sing to you. Father, we're so thankful that we can gather together. This Christmas, a little bit different, but Jesus, you're the same. We can worship you, we can sing to you, we can give our lives to you, and we're so thankful that we can do that together here in person or in our homes. And we just pray our hearts would honor you this Christmas. Jesus, would you have your way with us? Would you have your way in our lives, in our community, would you use us? We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christmas week. I've been looking forward to this since uh, like January 1, so I'm super excited. Glad you guys are here with us. I have a couple announcements for us. Uh, in terms of Christmas, if you don't know, we have a Christmas Eve service. It's going to be happening, obviously, this Thursday. So if you aren't planning to attend, we would love to see you. If you can't be here in person, you can join us online. Our service times are 4.30 p.m. and 6.30. So either of those times, 4.30 or 6.30, we would love to have you if 
If you're looking for a way to serve, a way to be a part, we have lots of opportunities and are working to make it safe. So if that's something you wanna do, you want your kids to be a part of, I know the Christmas season, everyone's looking for a way. Okay, how do we be a part of this? We have those opportunities available. You can go on the website. All you have to do, go on the website, coasthillschurch.org, and you can just type in Christmas in the search bar, and that will take you to service times and what those volunteer opportunities are. So we wanna make sure those are available for you, and we'd love to see you on Christmas Eve. As well, we are doing an outreach this Christmas. As always, per our normal practice, we are finding a way to minister to our community locally and globally, and we're calling that the gift of the word. So hopefully you got a bookmark, you have that in front of you. If you didn't, you can grab that. But if you're going to just go and find out more information, you can go on the website and just type in gift of the word. We have ways that you can serve, ways that you can give, ways that you can pray. So we want to make sure that you're aware of that, you're a part of that. That's something that you and your family can do this Christmas. And basically what that is, locally we're focusing on families in need specifically families who have brought vulnerable children into their homes. So foster families and families in that kind of situation. And we're going to be reaching out and ministering to them. Globally, we're translating the Bible into a language for a people who don't have the Bible in their language. So that's something that we're partnering. It's a long-term vision for us as a church. We're going to be doing this for the next five to ten years, but it's something that we have a partner that we're committed to translating the Bible, and you can partner with us in that. So we want to make sure you know that. It's there for you. We would love for you to be a part of that with us. Now we're just going to take a moment. You may or may not know the people around you, so we'll just give you a moment to say hello, find out what they love about Christmas, and we'll be back with you guys just in a couple minutes. Well, hello, everybody. I'm back. Great to see you guys. Hi, John Colston. I'm really happy to see you. I'm ho I know. I'm hoping that'll happen by the end of service. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is why we moved announcements, because none of you listen while after turn and greet. 
but I need to get your attention because I want to introduce you to an incredible couple. Would you please welcome Willis and Wendy to the stage along with Adam and myself. All right, all right, okay, you're still talking amongst each other. No, now it's my turn. I want to introduce you to someone incredible. Once again, will you please welcome Willis and Wendy to the stage with uh, Adam and I. Excellent. Man, I missed you guys. The Italians, they're still in shorts. I can't believe it. <gasps> and you're back. Welcome home. Great. All the way from Italy for Christmas. I feel like I just got my gift. Great to see you. Um, and I've got something to do. We can't talk now. I have to. <laughs> hey, I am so blessed by you guys and your ministry, and I would love to know how it began. And, uh, and I'm going to let you describe. It's foster care adoption. I want you guys to describe, but I, I want to talk a little bit about how this whole thing began in your hearts. So, yeah, it's, uh, it all started really unconventionally. Um, you know, in the, the process of fostering and adopting, um, there was a lot of ups and downs. Um, but, you know, we took a lot of comfort in God's promises uh, and God's, uh, you know, gave some verses to Wendy and Isaiah, which is why uh, we named Izzy Isaiah. And, um, yeah, uh, I think the process of, uh, you know, adopting, I think it was uh, just an amazing journey um, in that we were able to, you know, really see, you know, God's adopted us into his family. He's adopted everybody. And so um, to be able to see a tangible uh, way of what God's done for us um, through adoption was really, really powerful for Wendy and I. Um, so go ahead. No, I don't know. Oh, no, I was just going to say uh, my, my son, Asher, uh, said something to Wendy we thought was really funny. You know, he came up to, to Wendy and just kind of about a, week ago. You know, about a week ago went up to her and said, you know, mom, we're all adopted, but Izzy, He's adopted twice. So, uh, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so we thought that was pretty cool. Wendy, um, tell, that Willis's part, tell us a little bit about your heart, the verse in Isaiah that the Lord gave you, uh, name of the ministry. Tell us a little bit about the ministry that you guys do. Why don't you take it from there? Sure. Um, so as Willis said, the journey is um, in foster care is always uh, a roller coaster of ups and downs. And um, Izzy was our sixth foster child. And um, so at that time, we were more accustomed to saying goodbye. And um, and then as I was praying for him in the first month that he was with us, uh, the Lord gave me a couple different verses in Isaiah that were promises over his life. And um, at that time, I just wrote in my journal, if we, if we get to keep this baby, we're going to name him Isaiah after these promises. And um, so it's a privilege to stand here today and see that come true. It's... Um, it's just been a, a wonderful testament, I think, of God's promises in our life as a family. And to walk our own children through that has been, uh, it really has been a, a difficult privilege. Yeah. Now tell us a little bit about the ministry, either you or Willis. <laughs> um, so what I found in being a foster mom, um, so we have three children, we have three biological children, and when we started to take in foster children, um, we noticed that there, you know, when you bring in your bio kids, usually you get showers, and there's um, a community that comes around you that really helps you, helps you take that child in and care for the child, and um, we discovered that that's not something that takes place when you foster, and so usually you're, you're bringing in a newborn, and you're, you're really tired, and no one's really bringing you meals, and you're kind of trying to find clothes at Target because you just got this kid last night and you weren't sure what, what size they were going to be and all these different things. And so um, we, we didn't have much of a community when we started this. And so we, we felt like um, that foster families could be that much more successful if they did have a community. So um, a year or two into fostering, Willis and I started this group, Heart and Home, um, which is now a nonprofit. And we've had the joy of working with Coast Hills because it's, I feel like, a foster care and adoption is part of your DNA as a church, and it's something that we've never had to sell here. It's just part of what this church stands for and, and what it's about. And so um, we've partnered with them in, in trying to provide for foster families and adoptive families and make them stronger in the journey so that they can finish. 
Am I talking too much? No. <laughs> Not, I keep no. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, Listen, whoa, whoa. you're speaking right. my language. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm saying I'm looking at I'm I'm able to see my wife, you know. He so, starts because I, I tend to finish long. <laughs> no, hey, listen, ask them, so do I. So yeah. <laughs> you're good to go. But um, you know, I'm sitting here looking at my wife and uh, you're from you know Izzy to Isaiah, right? Um, when we, we were fostering, we the one of the first guys that came with us, he was 16, his name was Killer. Oh, and, and we brought him so much, he brought us so much joy, we yeah. named him Isaac oh. uh, for laughter. Yeah. And I just love the new life yeah. that our kids are able to have because um, we're following the example of God. And that's, you know, I'm going to get emotional because I know my own family and mm-hmm. I just know... Like you always go walk into this thinking, I'm going to do something for this child. Mm -hmm. But like our children have changed our lives. Like I'm a better human being because of the kids that God has given us biologically and that we've adopted. And as a church, we just want to say um, we're proud of you. Hmm. And I say the word proud in a very spiritual way. Well, if if I could respond to that, um, I think... One of the things, probably the thing that I love most about the name Isaiah is what it means. It means the Lord is salvation. And I think that's, that's like, that's the ticket right there. It's, it's not any foster family or adoptive family. It's the Lord is salvation. And we get to be, um, I think once that hits, once that's hit Willis and I on a personal level, what that means to us, it's just, it's impossible not to pay it forward in some, in some way. Yeah. And so if you want to get connected to this ministry in some way or fashion, just connect with us here at the church. We will get you connected to Willis and Wendy. Um, you're looking at two phenomenal human beings, two incredibly sh- bright, shining lights in our community. Um, let's just give the Lord an applause for their lives. Amen. Amen. And today we get the privilege of dedicating Isaiah. Come on up, gang. I threatened all of them that they'd have to give a speech. <laughs> Come on up. All right. You at least have to tell everybody your names, okay? All right. So. Ellie. Ellie. Asher. Malia. Izzy, what's your name? No, and. No all right. So, Izzy, why don't you, Isaiah, why don't you come over here and stand next Izzy, to Dad? Can you, can, why don't you stand next to Dad, huh? There you go, because he's going to protect you from all these people. That's what dads do. All right. Dad, you got to share a little bit, but now we all get the privilege of seeing your incredible family. Um, why is this dedication? I know you have committed all of your kids to the Lord, but why is Isaiah special? Like, if you were to speak a blessing over his life right now, what would you say about Isaiah? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, just kind of his, his own journey, um, I think, you know, God has, you know, really big plans for him. And, um, yeah, we're just really excited to, you know, dedicate, it, dedicate him to, to God. I mean, he was given to us by, by God. And, yeah, we're just excited to see how he grows and, you know, the community here just supporting him and his walk with God. And, um, you know, everything that Wendy and I will be doing to support, uh, you know, his relationship with God. And, yeah, we're just excited to see, um, you know, what God has for him. Because I think his Amen. history uh, really is telling. And I think it, it means that he's going to do something really impactful in this world. Amen. Amen. Um, church, uh, this is a godly family. And here at our church, we believe in dedicating our children to the Lord. Uh, if you remember the story of little Samuel... Hannah could not have a child, and she prayed, and the Lord gave her a child, and she committed her child to the Lord. And the church, we look to the Old Testament as an example of what to practice in the New Testament. We're living New Testament lives. And so because she set an example as a godly parent and dedicated her child to the Lord, we're going to dedicate Isaiah to the Lord. We're going to commit him to Jesus Christ, but we do that together as a church. So what I'm going to ask you do is stretch out your hands symbolically because you're going to be along with me dedicating this precious child to the Lord. And I'm going to ask Adam to pray for Isaiah. Um, and I have to say this. Uh, we were Sorry, put your hands down just for a second. We were supposed to do this last week. And um, Andrea and my whole family, we were... Um, um, 
captive to our homes for a few days. And so uh, we weren't able to come. So we didn't know they weren't going to do the dedication last week. So we're up, you know, we're watching the service online. Bill did a phenomenal job. And um, the chins didn't come up. And Andre's like, yes. And I'm like, I don't know if we're supposed to applaud that they didn't do a dedication, right? Um, but I'm so excited to be here tonight. And so I'm going to, I'm clean. So I'm going to actually lay my hands on dad. And I'm going to ask Adam to pray. Family, why don't we all just come real close together? You can. Um, you're safe. And uh, church, would you raise your hands toward this incredible family as Adam uh, prays for them? Well, Father, we thank you. And God, we thank you for the way that you work in our lives Specifically, Lord, as you worked in Wendy and Willis's lives, Father, and put a burden on their heart to adopt and bring children in. And Lord, do what you did. And Father, today we lift Amen. this family up to you. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for who they are and praise you for the way that you're working. And God, we just thank you that you have given them a plan and a vision for their life through your word. And Father, we lift up Isaiah today. Father, we thank you that his name points back to you, that there is hope of salvation. And Father, we dedicate him today knowing that he will grow up. And Father, we ask that you would just bring him to a point through uh, the love and care of his family and for those that are around him, this church and other friends, God, that they would continue to build into him your word, demonstrate to him your love and exemplify what it means to respond in faith. So Lord, we lift up Isaiah to you. We ask that you watch over him, that you guide him, that you lead him, Lord, that you would speak to him. And like the mighty prophet, that he would respond to your voice, and that he would go forth and proclaim your word, that he would be a young man that is ready and willing to do whatever you call him to. Father, we thank you and praise you for this family. And Lord, we lift up Malia and Ellie and Asher as big brother and big sisters, Lord, we ask that you watch over them as well and guide them as they play their part in this yes. process and continue to raise up their little brother along with mom and dad. So Father, we lift up this family to you and God, collectively as a church, we pray together in your son's name and everyone said, amen. Hey amen. church, would you just continue with me in a prayer? You can put your hand down just for a minute. Lord, I want to thank you that this family has set an example of faith true religion. There's no lie about taking care of widows and orphans. And so, Lord, I pray that the spirit that you poured out on them with the burden and conviction to move forward by faith, you would also pour out on each and every person at this church. That this would not be just something that we do, but it would define us. And I pray, Lord, that as you have adopted us, just like Asher said, that each one of us would sense the burden to follow the practice that you've put into place and that we as well would join in following this family's example. It's in Jesus' name we pray a blessing over Isaiah. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Well, like we said, uh, as you heard in announcements, if you want to get connected with more info, either of the tables, you can find Wendy and Willis and uh, some of the volunteers, a part of that team to get some more info. But we're going to prepare our hearts now for God's word. So I want to take some time through this next song as we reflect and look forward to Christmas. Just think about the story that we all know so well. So I want to ask that you would do that as we continue in our service and we get ready for the sermon. As much as this song is not so much a praise to God, but the song ministers with the avenue of his spirit speaking to us of the wonder of his birth. So as we go through and sing, pray and let the Lord speak to your heart the wonder of that moment, this king that came as a baby. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know 
that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new and this child that you deliver would soon deliver you Mary did you know that your baby boy would give sight to the blind man Mary did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trot and this child is little baby you kiss the face of god oh mary did you know Did you know? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again. The lame will leap, the dumb will speak, the praises of the Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy has come to the big land? This sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. The great I am. Oh, Mary, did you know? Father, Luke was faithful to write that Mary pondered all of these things in her heart. And I wonder, after giving birth, what was Mary thinking? And I'm just so thankful that she was faithful to be obedient to the word of God. She was empowered by your spirit, no different than the chins, who determined to be convicted by your spirit, empowered by your spirit to do your word. And I pray that Mary's life and the chins' life would set an example for all of us to follow. That whatever your word says for us to do, we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Merry Christmas. I'm so excited. We've got our Christmas Eve service. The tent is going down. There's going to be fireside living beach kind of experience. So we've got, we're going to have beach, I'm not beach pits, we're going to have fire pits. What's the word, Chet? Fire pits uh, all through the whole parking lot, candlelight service outside. Um, we even have a blanket to keep you warm, a special little gift from Christmas, from uh, Coast Hills Church. Um, I doubt the blanket that we got you will complete keep you completely warm. So 
you might want to bring your own uh, and sit as close as you can next to the fire pit. So tent is going down. We're going to turn the parking lot into an incredible place to worship the Lord Jesus Christ under the stars at 4.30 and 6.30. Really looking forward to seeing you guys here. Now, I don't know what puts you into the Christmas spirit, but Luke chapter 1 definitely does it for me. We're going to take a break from Acts this week and go to Luke chapter 1 if you've got your Bible. But as well, I love Christmas for many reasons. Um, I don't know if you guys have been participating in family dinner. I would encourage you to do it. Go on our app, look at the family dinner section on the app. There's a verse, there's a challenge, there's questions. We love it so much. Uh, My family and I, we do two family dinners. So we have our own. And then on Friday nights, we have another family dinner um, with our extended family. And um, this past family dinner on Friday night, Andrea, had arranged, we went down to Donna Hillman's mother, who's 91 years old. Donna, where are you? Are you here? Yeah, there. Oh, is the family here? Or is just is just Donna today? Okay. They're coming Christmas Eve. Um, and so we got to meet Donna, her sister, and her mother, who was a concert organist for 40 over 40 years. So she did Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Angels We Have Heard on High, and we got to have a full-on COVID safe caroling experience at uh, Donna's grandmother's house, uh, mother's house who lives right down the street from us. She did every, 91 years old, she did every song by heart and was, you should have seen her feet and all going all over that organ. It was absolutely incredible. I walked away from the experience going, okay, I'm in the Christmas mood. I'm officially in. I mean, you can't not be. Now, I don't know what gets you in, but it was singing songs about Jesus. It's being in the word that should get us in. So we're going to be taking a look at Luke chapter 1 today uh, and looking back at the experience that Mary had. Now, I don't know if the name George Bailey does anything to you. Some of you are going, I know George. The younger people are going, I have no idea what you're talking about. I was speaking to someone about George Bailey, and they said, I've had Baileys before. That's not the Bailey I'm talking about. It's Christmas. He had come to the place in his life where he did not want to live any longer. He wanted to give it all up and jump off a bridge. But there was an angel Clarence, odd body, if you remember, and he needed to earn his wings. Oh, now you're getting it. It's the movie. It's a wonderful life. And so he was given a view of George Bailey's incredible life and how he saved his brother, how he saved a pharmacist, how he saved his town, but George couldn't see any bit of his life. And so Clarence came up with the great idea to let George experience what life would have been like without George Bailey. The pharmacist, he was in jail because George didn't help him and discover that he was about to make an accident with a prescription. His wife had become a spinster. The town had become a ghetto. And George began to realize, wow, it really is a wonderful life. Now, if I could just for a minute replace the name with George, of George Bailey, and if I could say Jesus Christ. Oh, not that Jesus was on a bridge one day and Clarence showed up. But could you, Christian, imagine a moment if Jesus never came to the world? I want you to stop. There'd be no Christmas, no lights, no candles, no Christmas cookies. And I don't know how cookies got associated with Christmas, but I really do believe we are blessed and highly favored. There might not be a thing known as hospitals. Did you know they were spurred from the church? There might not be languages that you could read. Because do you know that the church has translated more languages than any institution in the world? Think of what life would have been like had not Jesus come to the world. And I wonder, like George, as a believer, who's grown up in the church, do we forget how wonderful the life is with Jesus Christ? 
well, I want to take a look back like Clarence did. I'm going to follow Clarence Odd, uh, Oddbody's example. And I'm going to go back to the beginning. And I want to see, well, what it was when Jesus was born. Because maybe we'll begin to experience in Christian, could you just kind of grab your Bible as if you're opening it for the first time? Could you maybe hear the exhortation of Jesus and get back to your first love when you first got saved? And don't let this story just simply be, oh, the Christmas story. Let's take a look at it as if it never was to happen and begin to see how wonderful our life is with Jesus Christ. It's Luke chapter 1. I'm going to pick it up in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Lazarus. Nazareth, not Lazarus. Nazareth. God's on the move, and I love this. No one knew that God was on the move, but God is on the move. And Christian, can I tell you how wonderful our life is? That God's silence, apparent silence, is not his inactivity. No one knew that God had sent from the heavens Gabriel to Mary in Nazareth. No one had any idea what God was planning. His silence, though, is not his inactivity, and he sent Gabriel on the sixth month. Now, stop there for a moment. I know you're wondering, how will we get through the story if I'm picking apart word by word? But I want you to see how wonderful this life is. He was sent on the sixth month because God always operates at the right time time. Do you remember Sarah? Oh, it was way past childbearing, way past the opportunity to give birth. But in Genesis chapter 21, the Bible says, and when it was God's time, Sarah gave birth. It was the right time. It was not Sarah's time. It was way beyond the time. It was way too late, but it was God's time. For Mary, 13, 14 years old, maybe 15 or 16, it's way too early. I'm not married. But it was God's time. He always operates on the right time. He's always on the move, and he was sent to Nazareth. I don't know what visual you have of Nazareth. But archaeologists say that um, it is all, was only about 200 to 400 people, just a few families that lived in Nazareth. Nazareth was, Nazareth was not even a proper town so that the Romans bypassed Nazareth. Okay, do you remember cars? Where that town, what was it, uh, Radiator Springs, it got forgotten because the road went around it and no one ever went to Radiator Springs again? That was Nazareth. The road went around Nazareth. It's like the Romans were embarrassed of it. And it went to a town by the name of Sephorus. Sephorus was an incredible Roman city, only about five miles to the west of Nazareth. Sephorus was built up. It had Roman roads. It had the Roman center heart street. The, 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 uh, um, it had the Roman palisades, the Roman homes. Nazareth, well, that's where all the builders lived. That was the suburb of Sephora. No wonder Joseph was a carpenter. No wonder he was a builder because he would have gone to Sephora most likely with Jesus and have made those Roman homes only a few miles away to walk back to Nazareth. It was a nothing, nobody town. But it was a town that God sent Gabriel to because God always always bends toward humility. Always. You see, he resists the proud, but he gives more grace to the humble. In fact, the Bible says, humble yourself before the Lord and he'll exalt you. God always bends towards the humble. So if you've been in a fight with your spouse, go the humble route. God will be on your side. Okay, there must be a lot of marital arguments because it got way too silent, way too quick. I get it, COVID, you've been locked in with your spouse way too long. You see, humility is where God bends towards. And he sent Gabriel. Now, Gabriel is an angel. 
And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that angels are ministering spirits. And you remember in Luke chapter 22, right before the cross, God sent angels to minister to Jesus before the cross because they're ministering spirits. They're ministering spirits for us. The Bible says that we entertain angels without even knowing it. And let me give you an example of a ministering spirit. It was just this past week, it's Louisiana Tech. The quarterback of Louisiana Tech had a severe, in fact, it's called a grotesque leg injury. Well, as soon as Luke Anthony went down, the trainers ran on the field. The trainers wrapped up his body. The trainers took care of him. The trainers were giving him fluids. The trainers were making sure that he was okay. The trainers put him on the stretcher and the trainers went with him to the hospital. Those trainers are like our angels. And the Bible says that as soon as we stumble our foot against a stone, he sends out the trainers. He sends out the angels to minister to us and to take care of us. And so he sent Gabriel, this ministering spirit, and look at verse 27, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. He was sent to a virgin. Now, that word's really important, and let me tell you why that word's important. Because God is faithful to his word. It's Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You know the scripture. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. It's Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Once again, the Lord being faithful to his word that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. That's why Joseph's line is given to us. The only reason Joseph's entire line is given to us was to prove that he was of the house of David to show that when there was a census, Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem to fulfill exactly what God said would happen. Can I remind you of Caesar Augustus? Caesar Augustus was known as the son of God. I don't know if you knew that. He brought peace to Rome. He was the foster adopted son of Julius Caesar. He started the Roman Empire. And he made a decision, I'm going to count everybody in Rome to show how powerful I am. Augustus, did you know that you were being directed by God himself, and that God put it in your heart because Joseph was in Nazareth and Joseph was born of the house of David. So Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem. Augustus, you are being controlled by the almighty hand of God. I don't know what that does for you, believer, because I don't know what promise God has given you. But he is true to his word, even when it seems impossible. And I want you to keep that in mind because that's the wonderful life. God is true to his word. He's orchestrating his great plan. And he reveals this great plan to Mary. Humble Mary. Now, we get to know Mary in her song. So would you flip a page over for me? I want you to see Mary for just a moment. I want you to understand who this woman, this young girl was. Look at uh, Luke chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. He's regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all nations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He puts down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He's filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. You see, out of the abundance of the heart speaks the mouth. And we get to know Mary just a little bit here in her own song. And a couple of things that we get to know about Mary, she's poor. She's poor. She's lowly. She's hungry. She's in Nazareth. She's in need. And you read this in her words. 
She's lowly. She's poor. She filled the hungry. This is someone who had great need, and God turned his ear to Mary and her prayers because Mary was not only poor and hungry and in need, Mary was a worshiper of God. It didn't matter her circumstance. It didn't matter she was from Nazareth or Laguna Niguel. She was a worshiper of God. My soul, she says, magnifies the Lord. She feared God. She learned the fear of God through Moses. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, listen to this, church. And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you? Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. What does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God? Now, listen to what it means. To walk in all his ways. You want to know what it means to fear the Lord? Listen to what Moses directed. To walk in all of his ways. Not some of his ways. Not when you feel like it. Not when you're not feeling so great about it. To walk in all of his ways. To love him. Now this is not just a feeling in the midst of worship. This is a choice when the rubber meets the road of faith. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command to you today for your good. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Mary fears the Lord. She loves him. She's worshiping. It doesn't matter her experience. She is choosing to live in the fear of the Lord. Now take a look at Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read now verse 28. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord's with you. Blessed are you among women. That is the most wonderful thing about our life. You see, there is a reason that she was blessed, there is a reason that she was highly favored. And the angel tells her why. Mary, let me tell you why you are favored. Because the Lord is with you. Now, gang, that should be a great comfort to all of us, and I'm going to tell you why. Mary goes off to Elizabeth after this announcement. I'm going to catapult the story for just a minute. And she stays with Elizabeth, who's pregnant six months, we just discovered. She stays with Elizabeth for three months, so probably until she has John the baptizer. Then Mary, she leaves Elizabeth. She goes back to Nazareth. But when she goes back to Nazareth, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, she's found to be with child. In other words, she didn't tell anybody. So she comes back and her belly is showing. She's three months pregnant. Joseph comes over to Mary's house to see her for the first time in three months. And he found her pregnant. So Mary goes, Joseph, it's not what you think. (laughs) Let me tell you, Holy Spirit came upon me. Now you're Joseph and you're hearing this for the first time, okay? So you're hearing this whole like, don't worry about it. God himself, this is God's baby, okay? I don't know how to explain this to you. I woke up pregnant. Joseph, I'm telling you, it's a true story. I I know you found me pregnant, but I got it. Now, Joseph, how many of you would be struggling with this right now, right? I mean, the whole virgin birth, Isaiah 7, I get it's there. But imagine your girlfriend comes home after three months and she's pregnant and tells you this story. So Joseph decides, listen, Mary, you're a great gal. I'm a good guy. I'm going to put you away quietly. The Lord intervenes. And the Lord gives him a dream. And tells Joseph, she's telling you the truth. The one that's within her is the Son of God, is from God. He is Emmanuel. Now, do you know what Emmanuel means? God with Mary. Somebody should correct me at this point, because that's not what it means. It means God with Mary. Okay, this side's got it. I want to come over here to this side. All right, here we go. God with? Now, I'm going to talk to the Italians because we know you guys to be very expressive. So here we go. Okay, God with? Perfect. I know that and I love that. Not God with Mary. God with us. Do you know what that means? That means we are highly favored and that we are blessed. That's the most wonderful life. We have the presence of Jesus. He's with us. He's with us as, the, as our spouse in life or in death. 
He's with, with us in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer. We are the bride of Christ, and he is with us. Now, the problem in our 21st century church, many people confuse highly favored and blessed with material and physical blessing. They replace it with festivity and being bountiful. They forgot the blessing of having Jesus with us, and they associate highly favored with simple physical blessing. Gang, if that's all, it cheapens the blessing and favor of his presence. Church, I need us to hear this, because this is something the first century church, they understood. Paul writes them in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, and he says, you are more than a conqueror. Now, let me tell you what's more than a conqueror. A conqueror is someone who wins the battle physically. They can see it, they live it, and they know it. But someone who's more than a conqueror doesn't need to see that the battle's won. They already believe they have the victory. And let me tell you about this first church. He said to them, what can separate you from the love of Christ? A beating? Imprisonment? Tumults? The gladiator arena? What can separate you from the love of Christ? He says, we're more than conquerors. Nothing will separate you from the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. The first century church understood this. Jesus even makes the theology of physical and material blessings immaterial. And he says, why would you treasure something that rust and moth are going to destroy. My daughter came home from college, and so did all of her stuff. And her stuff got dumped into my garage. And I like, my garage is like my domain. It's like, it's organized. I know where everything is. I, everything has a space. And then she comes home. And everything is just in the garage. So I have to go to the dump yesterday to get rid of things that I own so that we can put things that she owns in my garage. And I called a friend of mine and I left the garage, I left the dump and I actually felt good about myself. And I realized I feel good about myself every time I leave the dump. In fact, going to the dump is like walking through the aisles of Costco for me. I don't know what it is about the aisles of Costco, but it's actually rejuvenating and refreshing just to see Costco sometimes. And I've got the same feeling when I was driving into the dump and as I was leaving, I felt so fresh, I felt so clean and then I began to ask myself, why did I have all that stuff anyway that I'm throwing away to store more stuff so that I can get more stuff to get more stuff and cheapen the beauty of being highly favored and blessed? Because Jesus Christ will never leave me or forsake me. This is the most wonderful life. A life with Jesus Christ? A life knowing that he's with me all of the time in sickness or in health? Can I tell you, Mary was not delivered from poverty. She actually delivered in a stable. And because Jesus was with her, a few kings showed up and blessed them with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they were able to live off that for several years because Jesus was with her. That's her story. I want that story. Oh, can I remind you of Joseph? Can you imagine finding out that Herod wants to kill all the children in the land that are two years and younger? What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? But because Jesus was with Joseph, he knew exactly what to do. And he was told in a dream to go to Egypt. Gang, don't cheapen the blessing of his presence in your life by associating the blessing with what you have or what you don't have. The wonderful life is the fact that we have Jesus. And so though we may be physically distanced, he is spiritually so close. Though we may be in quarantine, oh, he's right there in our living room with us. And though you may be concerned about your health. He promises never to leave us, nor forsake us. That's Jesus. One of my kids, he said to me the other day, he said, Dad, he goes, social distance is giving me social anxiety. 
And there's something about the reality of nine months of this that begins to affect the way that we think and begins to affect the way that we live. And we begin to associate our blessing with our experience. We've got to move from our experience like Mary to see we are blessed and highly flavored. We have the wonderful life simply because Jesus is with us. Mary couldn't see it either. Take a look at Luke chapter 1, verse 29. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered, what manner of greeting was this? Mary was troubled. She was troubled by what she saw. Now, this word troubled, maybe you want to circle it. It means she was disturbed through and through. Now, I don't know what Gabriel looked like, okay? And I don't know what her experience was. Was he like glow-in-the-dark Gabriel? Was he just like 10-foot Gabriel? I don't know what Gabriel looked like, but I do know that one angel destroyed an army of 185,000 Syrians overnight. I know that's one angel. I know that two angels destroyed the entire city of Sodom and Gomorrah by themselves. I know the Bible tells me that seraphim have six wings and eyes everywhere. So I don't know what Gabriel looked like, but when Mary saw Gabriel, she was troubled by what she saw. I think I may have been troubled by what I saw. And that, my friends, is the greatest problem in the plight of humanity. We get troubled so easily by what we see. We get troubled so easily by what we experience. Here is God, imagine God's perspective. Here is God sending a message of hope, sending a light, sending a message of encouragement. And Mary's troubled by what she sees. Now gang, stop for a moment. Let's look back at 2020 and look at what we've seen. Welcome to COVID. In fact, every time I sneeze now, I don't say God bless you. I say, not COVID. Every time. It's the new God bless you. Achoo, not COVID. I'm telling you. Everywhere you go. Because when you sneeze now, people from everywhere in Target go, Fuck! they just like look at you. And then they run. Okay? And you're, you're, now there's directional ways for us to go into Target. Please go this way. I don't want to go that way. The item I need is right there. But we want you to go all the way around the store. This is a marketing scheme. This is not COVID. This is like when you go through the airport and they put you through the mall till you get to your gate. They're using it as their opportunity. Now, some of you would disagree with that, and I'm fine with that. But if you go to Target and you sneeze, trust me, announce, not COVID. You have to in these days. Think of the division. The division in our country. Think of Seattle. Think of the chaos that we are living in. And if you take a look at all of what you see, you're going to be just as troubled as Mary. Filled with fear. That's exactly what Mary was. And let me tell you what fear does. Two times this week, Tom Cruise was on set. And two times this week, he had an explicative tirade on people on set that slipped their mask down. You know why? He wants to live forever. He wants to stay young forever. In fact, 58-year-old Tom Cruise looks like 25-year-old Tom Cruise. And if you believe no work has been done, you're wrong. (laughs) And so when he sees someone's mask off, oh, he's going to scream and he's going to yell. And his agent has to get on and, and has to make amends for all of this because now it's national news. He's living in fear and fear has led to anger. Fears led to depression. Do you know the suicide rate in the United States of America has skyrocketed? Do you know that November held the highest divorce rate in the United States of America in a long time? You know why? People are having to spend time together and they don't know what to do. You see, fear leads to anger. Fear leads to depression. Fear leads to anxiety, and nine months of living in fear by what we see going on all around us? Well, the University of Minnesota did a study on fear. 
You see, when you live in fear, let me tell you what happens. Your body releases a hormone that tells the rest of your body, give your legs and your eyes a lot of energy so that you can see everything clearly and run as fast as you can. Take some energy from your stomach, take some energy from your kidneys, take some energy from uh, uh, all your internal organs, and take some energy from your brain. Give it all to your legs, all to your eyes. You're in a constant state of wanting to run. Well, when you take energy from your stomach, you develop ulcers. When you take energy from your brain, you aren't as smart as what you think you are. And when you take energy from your kidney and take energy from your pancreas and take energy from everywhere else because you're living in a state of fear, guess what, gang? You actually enter into the vulnerable category because your immune system is no longer fighting properly. Fear actually puts us in the vulnerable category. And the only fight that we have against fear is faith. Look what the angel said to Mary. She's troubled. Verse 30, then the angel said to her, here's the message from God. Here's the word of God. And the angel says to Mary, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive and in your womb bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Stop there for just a moment. The angel took her to the word of God. And the only fight that we have against fear is faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of God. That's Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And the most wonderful life that we can have is not watching every Hallmark movie that's available as we're in quarantine. The most wonderful life that we can have is memorizing the sailor verse, is choosing to read Luke 1, 2, 3, and 4 to become a person of the word. Every morning for an hour, I listen to a sermon. And I listen to someone preach me six times a week. And I'm listening to the word of God invested into my life. And I'm amazed at the peace that I have found as God sends his messenger Gabriel in my life every single morning and gives me the word of God. Look what he says to her. He says to Mary, this is what God wants you to hear. Take a look, if you would. Um, Gabriel points Mary to Jesus. Look at this. It's uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Gabriel points Mary to Jesus through the word of God. Well, that makes sense to me. Because when Jesus was describing himself to the disciples after the resurrection, he said, let me show, me, let me show you in the, me in the, in the Old Testament. Let me show me in the prophets. Let me show me in the law of Moses. Let me show me in the Psalms. And I want you to see that the whole wor- word is written and it points to me. Gang, we're in the same place that Mary was. Jesus wasn't physically there. She chose to believe the word of God by faith. She saw the evidence of the word of God, but she couldn't see Jesus, much like I can see the evidence of God's word in the chins. They're living the most wonderful life. They are living by the word of God. They know the word of God, and I can see God working in their life in the same way that Mary could see God working in her life, but she was living by faith. Jesus wasn't there with her. She was in the same position that we are today. And Gabriel comes on the scene, and Mary's troubled, and so what Gabriel does is he points Mary to Jesus through the word of God. And something begins to happen in Mary's heart. No longer is she troubled. You see, it's why Paul would say that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. And if we would find ourselves to be living the most wonderful life, we will find ourselves in the word of God. And here's what happens when you're in the word of God. Here's what happens when you're hearing from God. He's going to point you to Jesus and listen to the result of it. It's Isaiah 26, verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace 
whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah, the Lord is everlasting strength. It's Isaiah 26, 3. When God speaks the word of God into us, we're given peace. And that's why Gabriel was pointing Mary to the word. Now look what he says about Jesus. He will be great. Stop there if you would. I wonder if Gabriel like was trying to search for a word to describe Jesus in one word. Like, how was he going to get across in the Hebrew language, in the Greek language, in the Aramaic language, in the English language? How was he going to get across a one-word thing about Jesus? And he came out with the word, Jesus is mega. Jesus is mega. And here's the angel Gabriel. Mary is troubled. And he describes Jesus to her. Gang, what would the world be like without Jesus? He says of Jesus, listen, he'll be great and be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Son of the highest? Oh, he's equal to God. In fact, when Isaiah would write of him, he would call him the almighty God. Son of the highest is saying he is equal to God. Son of David? Oh, church, he's a promise keeper. He promised David in 2 Samuel that someone would sit on his throne from his family forever. It's Jesus. He's great. King of Israel, eternal king. He's powerful. He's sovereign. But this is not how Jesus would describe himself. This is where we close. When Jesus would talk about his greatness, he would say this. It's John chapter 15. You know it better than me. John chapter 15, verse 13. And if you have your Bible, would you just turn there? Because I want you to see how Jesus describes greatness. John chapter 15, as he talks about himself in verse 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay one's life down for his friends. Jesus didn't talk about his greatness in what he had. He didn't even talk about greatness in who he was. He didn't describe his greatness by the house that he owned, the portfolio that he had, or the stuff in his garage. He didn't describe his greatness by being the king of kings and the lord of lords. Jesus described his greatness in his relationship with you and I. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Not by how much he had, not by who he was, but by what he would give. You see, sacrificial giving is the most wonderful life. It's why Jesus would say it's more blessed to give than to receive. And as Jesus was describing his greatness, oh, let me tell you, I'm so great because I've got a relationship with you. That's great love. And gang, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't know the wonderful life. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm so grateful for your word once again. I'm so thankful that you looked upon Mary and you said the word of God. You're blessed and highly favored because the Lord's with you. And so Jesus, we can't help but look back at 2,000 years of church history and be grateful that you're with us. And look at today and the gifts that you've given us. Hey, church, as you're in your own attitude of prayer, 
maybe Clarence Oddbody needs to visit you. You got caught up in the chaos. For nine months, you've been giving birth to fear. Well, I got a wonderful life for you. Where you can be blessed and highly favored. The Lord's with you. Now, for those of you who don't know Jesus, you come today with a friend. When Jesus was describing greatness, he didn't tout around, I'm the son of God. Do you know who I am? No, he said, I get to be in relationship with you by dying on a cross. That's great. He so desperately wants to be in a relationship with you that he died on a cross. He didn't come to earth just to be a swaddling in swaddling clothes in a manger and have a great little story with a manger scene. That, that, that was not the point. The point is the Son of God came to earth to live a sinless life, a life we could not live, so that he could give you peace with God and peace from God when he died on the cross and rose again three days later. This birth points to a resurrection. This birth points to peace with God. If you lack peace today, there's a way to have peace with God. To know that you can be saved. To know that you can be born again. Get a fresh start of life. And if you've been giving birth to fear for the last nine months, why not today be born again? And let God give birth to faith. And hear what the angel Gabriel said to Mary who was troubled. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Today, I'm offering you a great gift. His name is Jesus. See, the only way that you can be saved is if you receive the gift. I can't force the gift on you. It's got to be something that you decide. And the Spirit, He's speaking to you right now. Is there anyone today that would say, Today, I want to be saved? I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I want to know that if I died today, I would go to heaven. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? What's going to happen is the church is going to blow up in applause because they know how great the peace of God is. Is there anyone that would just raise their hand and say, yeah, that's me. Today, I want to receive the gift of Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, would you stand with me? Christmas Eve, we're going to be, fill be finishing this story. It is a wonderful life. And we're going to see how great Jesus is. We're going to understand the wonderful life that we have through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. Looking forward to seeing you this Thursday at either 4.30 or 6.30. Uh, why don't we worship the Lord and allow this to settle in our hearts. Let's not be troubled by what we see. Let's trust that God's on the move. The God of peace who has a message of peace for each one of us. Let's worship the Lord. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to bear the Oh 
come let us adore you oh come let us adore him oh come let us adore hear him cry the Father, what you've given us, we just say thank you that we can move past fear to faith because you came to be with us. Lord, we have your presence. We ask that we carry that hope and truth into this Christmas season. Use us to share that with those around us. 
and fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My name is Andrea. This is the close of our service where we take something practical out of what we've heard in the word and we put it in the form of a challenge and we carry that with us through our week so we don't just hear his word on Sunday, but we get to do his word every day through the week. So this week, our challenge is to act out your faith in God to do the impossible by praying for, giving to, and volunteering with our Christmas outreaches. Go to www.coasthillschurch.org forward slash gift of the word, and you can learn more about those outreaches there. But how beautiful that the giving, Christ said, no greater gift is this than to lay down, one lay down, lays down his life for his friends. And so Paul said, I'll show you my faith by my works. So we can live out our faith and find a way just to show his love to those around us. As well as a church, we memorize his word together. Meditate on that word throughout the week. Let's say the word that we memorized together last week. That was Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I love that word. That was my mama's favorite word growing up. So I remember that word because she said it all the time. This week, the word we're going to memorize, let's say that word together, Luke 1, 37. For with God, nothing will be possible, impossible. With God, nothing will be impossible. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I have a couple announcements for you. Don't forget, this Wednesday night, we do not have Community at Coast online because we have Thursday Eve, Christmas Eve service here outside live. So come join us, 4.30 and 6.30. As well, don't forget to bring your chairs as we gather around the fire together. And come for prayer. We have people here under the tents. Our prayer team is here to pray for you. If you're at home, call us and someone will pray with you. Call us at 949-362-0079, extension 7, during our service, and we'll pray with you. God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. Have a great week.